I'm Kevin, my wife's name is Ford BX257. Here we go another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the large Cobra Assault Helicopter, the 1987 Mamba, and its pilots, the Gyro Vipers. Now the Mamba helicopter makes its first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, issue number 64, as do the Gyro Vipers, but they're not shown with their helmets until later, oddly enough. Unfortunately, the Mamba does not make any cartoon appearances, like a lot of 1987 and 1988 characters, there is no cartoon during that time. The Mamba is a really large aircraft, mostly due to its long tail boom, and it measures about 22 inches from tail to nose, but if you include the rotor, which actually goes beyond the nose, it adds an extra 2 inches. That's 2 feet in overall length. However, despite that huge length, it's actually a very sleek craft. And it only measures about 6 inches from top to bottom. The main body of the Mamba is mostly this purple portion. So these black portions in the front, despite the fact of them having cockpits, are actually detachable. And they're called MOLT, or M-O-L-T, which means Mamba Offensive Light Tactical Attack Pods. And you can remove them by pulling down and then forward. This is a little bit awkward when the Mamba is fully armed, but I'll get into that in just a moment. You can see the attack pods are themselves fairly sleek. They look like rockets with this big elongated engine on the back. They have two very tiny rockets. And they just go into these tiny little holes. And you'll notice that there are holes on either side. So the rocket pods are not side specific to the Mamba. You can just put them in either side. Just rearrange the uh, rockets to whichever side that you want. Of course the Mamba has a fixed dual machine gun in the front and an opening cockpit with some nice detail on the inside. It of course has uh, some sticker detail as well. But you'll notice that the seat is actually very raked. It, you're almost lying the figure down in there. And despite the fact that there is a back peg here, for the hole of the back of the figure, I don't think it's really that necessary. It's very shallow, in fact, but you can just lie the figure in there and close it up. In issue 73 of the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, the Joes have actually taken a captured Mamba and are using it to infiltrate Cobra Island. But notice what they actually say about the uh, Mamba's accommodations. Whereas the pilot is sitting in the middle portion, which actually has a lot of room, the other Joes are sitting in the attack pods, which clearly don't have a lot of room. It's very interesting that Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book, would actually point that out. I'm not sure if he was aware that the toy had that deficiency or not. Here I've just put the other rocket on the other side of the winglet here. You can actually put them upside down if you want them underneath the winglets as well, seeing as the holes are sort of universal in that regard. But I'm just going to compare this to another small black Cobra aircraft, and that is the drone from the 1986 Night Raven. Very similar in a lot of ways, especially with the red glass, and of course the really cramped seating in there. And now for the main Mamba portion of the aircraft. The cockpit doesn't actually open the same way that the pods do, this sort of back hinged front and back, but it's actually hinged on the left side so it opens sideways. Not really sure why they changed the orientation there. But you can see that it does have some very minimal detail in there as well. This time there's no back peg and again I'm not sure why there was one in the first place. 
but the figure is still sort of cramped in there. You really have to do squeeze them in there. Kind of reminds me of how you put the uh, copperhead figure into the water moccasin. You just really do have to squeeze them in there. And just like the water moccasin, even though you can close this up rather well, you notice that there's actually a kind of a bulge to the canopy glass and that accommodates the figure's head. So there's really not a lot of room, despite the fact that he at least looks like he's sitting upright, unlike in the pots. The Mumba is a really well-armed aircraft with 11 missiles and bombs, including the two that were on each of the attack pods. Here, we have two of these missiles per side, making four of these particular missiles. And they have the more traditional dumbbell uh, peg and hole design. You notice that there is sort of a uh, design with the forward facing or forward pointing fins, very trident like. And that one went on this dumbbell peg here. And then there's one here, which is a sideways dumbbell peg. Underneath here, we have one of these bombs. There's another one on the other side. It's very awkward looking because I keep thinking that it should be oriented this way when really that's the fin. The fins are actually supposed to be on the very end of the uh, bomb and this is the nose. Again, we have your traditional uh, dumbbell peg. But you'll notice that there was actually a lever here. And while normally I would keep this thing really well up there into the peg so that it doesn't fall off, what you're actually supposed to do is you're actually supposed to leave it just a little bit in there, just so it's almost falling off, so that you can use the peg to deploy the bomb. It's, it's a really nice idea, but it doesn't really work very well in practice. Underneath the Mamba, we have its single large bomb, and it has its own little deploying mechanism. It's held in here by these little hooks. And this is the deploying lever, and once you flick that, it falls out. And that is a very good releasing mechanism. The bomb is, of course, still has that four swept fin design. But one very interesting thing is you'll notice that it also has a dumbbell peg in here. There was no dumbbell peg in the middle of the uh, bottom of the Mamba. So I'm not really sure why they designed this thing in here. It actually doesn't fit on many of the uh, other pegs, except for the sideways one. Of course, with only one of these bombs, I'm not really sure why you would want to do that. Perhaps at one point in time in the design process, there might have been um, just a traditional peg and lever type design here, like it there was on the side, but they went with this one, which is, like I said, far more uh, far more effective. It's very easy just to actually just pop this thing right back in there without having to actually open it up and then put it in there because these things are actually kind of far apart so it's actually nice that you can just do that one-handed. On the bottom you just saw that knob and when you rotate that you activate the Mamba's main feature the counter rotating rotors. The Mamba's unusual intermeshing counter-rotating blade arrangement is clearly based on the common HH-43 Husky helicopters of the 1950s and 60s. I say unusual, but common still produces helicopters with this rotor arrangement, like the K-Max K-1200. As you can see, the Mamba does not have a traditional tail rotor. It just has these vertical stabilizers. The Mamba gets most of its thrust and maneuverability power from its twin rotors, just like the helicopter that it's based on. And you can just pop these rotor blades off. You can see that there's quite a lot of detail that they wound up putting on this. 
both on the top and on the bottom as well. But these are thick, heavy blades and they're rather long. So it actually creates a bit of a problem over time. As you can see, they were just attached to this split mushroom peg here. And you can see a bit of the rotor in there, the white, uh, the white gearing. And the problem is, is that when you put this, such a heavy long blade on there, it actually winds, it actually wears away some of the um, connection point to this. So when you see a mamba which isn't working, or the knob doesn't seem to be rotating these things properly, it's not because the actual mechanism isn't working, it's because the blades have lost contact with just this uh, split mushroom peg. So you might want to split these apart and make sure that you have a lot of friction between those pegs and the hole here. Or do it like I've done and I've actually just sort of wrapped a tiny little rubber band around there just so that it's really wedged in there. And on the top, we have a removable engine cowling. show off the engine detail and it's very elaborate. I have to say that I've really grown very fond of the Mamba helicopter which surprises even me because when I first saw this at toy shows uh, many many years ago I was like well I don't really like the large use of this purple plastic. To me it just looks too much like plastic and it just sort of takes me out of the experience. But after displaying it with a lot of the other Cobra vehicles and playsets, the purple, black, and red just make it look so evil and aggressive that it sort of makes sense that they would use the purple. It's just very unique to the Mamba, uh, well, at least at this point, anyway. However, despite how much I love this thing now, there is one thing that's always aggravated me and continues to, and that is the cluster of missiles on each side of the Mamba. Unfortunately, they don't really make use of the bottom of the Mamba for these missiles, and they're really the source of a lot of problems. Of course, we have the, uh, the bomb release lever, which doesn't work unless you specifically make the bomb really loose, that it's almost falling off by itself anyway. And sometimes it doesn't even do that. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have missiles crashing into missiles because the missile pod has its own stuff. So when you detach this, this thing, not only is it bumping into this missile, it's bumping into the bomb on the bottom as well. And when you put the thing back on, let's say you still have the missiles on here, You put this thing in, there is actually a notch here to put the thruster hole into. You line that up, you, you try to push it up, but you can't because now the back fin and the missile have to go in between this bomb and the edge of the purple par portion of the Mamba. And it's also hitting against this now. So this is all crashing into one another and you have to make sure that everything is all lined up properly. It's not impossible to do, but I just wish that these things were spaced out properly so that you didn't have to really think about doing that. And one of the last and more unfortunate of the failings of this particular toy design is well, you'll notice that throughout the review, I've had either one or the other of the attack pods attached. And that is mostly because of this. Without the pods, or at least one of the pods attached, this thing is unbalanced. And that's mostly, despite the fact that it looks like there's a lot of weight on the front, the back tail boom is actually made of a very solid, heavy, sturdy plastic. And of course, one of the reasons for that is, well, when a kid is playing with this thing, they're obviously going to be holding the tail boom. So of course, this is the most sturdy portion of the thing. 
I mean, despite the, all the really cool features on here and all the missiles, if you have a broken tail boom on a helicopter, you don't have a helicopter. So I'm really grateful that they've made this a nice solid boom, but it's just way too heavy. What could have countered that? Well, maybe some landing gear, which the Mamba totally does not have. Instead, it has these odd black downward facing fins. It's almost like a Star Wars vehicle. I don't mean to disparage Star Wars vehicles, but you know how the old Kenner ones always had those little odd fins that just stuck down just to, just to simulate landing gear when the actual filming model didn't have any? Well, that's what they've gone and done here, and it's really unfortunate that they didn't put skids or just like a, like a fold-down wheel on the bottom or something. It's rather strange that this thing has no landing gear whatsoever. And now it's time for... Does a modern figure fit in it? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra Footloose figure as my example of a modern figure. Unfortunately, I don't have really high hopes for this. I'll have to scrunch him up as much as I possibly can to get him into here. And yes, he does fit. He's really squeezed in there, but it is possible. But what about the pods, which were almost impossible for the figures that they were actually meant for? Well, let's see. Unlike the main cockpit, which has a bit more width, these things are actually very narrow, and it's really hard to actually squeeze the figure down into it. Yeah, it's... I mean, it does work, but it's a really tight fit. Perhaps a figure without the vest would actually work a bit better. So just what would I compare the Cobra Mamba to within the Cobra Air Fleet? Well, you might think that I would compare it to the 1983 Fang, the small gyrocopter, but that is more of a patrol surprise attack vehicle, rather than this being more of a main combat vehicle. So I don't think that would be a fair comparison. What I would compare it to, however, might be a little bit controversial, because I would compare it to not another helicopter, but a jet, the 1984 Rattler. Both the Rattler and the Mamba are both ground attack aerial vehicles and the Rattler actually has 14 bombs and missiles versus the Mamba's 11 so they're not very far off as, as far as missile and bomb complement goes. Of course the Rattler also had VTOL jets so it could hover while attacking maybe not with all of its ex, um, armaments but at least with its machine gun at least two of its bombs and missiles. So what would the Mamba's opposite number on a G.I. Joe side be? Well, I could compare it to the 1986 Tomahawk, which is very close to the Mamba in release here, as well as having dual rotors. But I tend to think of the Tomahawk as more of a transport helicopter, and not as a specific full-on assault helicopter. So we'll have to go back further in time for the 1983 Dragonfly. I think this is a pretty fair comparison of assault copter versus assault copter. Although the Mamba does have the advantage with its detachable rocket pods and way more armament. But I tend to think that, well, Bill, being an excellent pilot, would give the Mamba more than a run for its money. Another contender to go up against on the G.I. Joe side might be the 1988 Skystorm Crosswing Chopper with its pilot windmill. Despite the fact that the Skystorm actually has less armament than even the Dragonfly, I think the fact that the Skystorm can actually transform into a jet can more than make up for the fact that the Mamba can deploy two rocket pods. The Cobra Mamba only comes with a single Gyro Viper pilot. Rather unfortunate because there is obviously spots for two more figures. He was never available again, even through Hasbro mail order, like a lot of driver figures. So it's unfortunately rather hard to get him on the aftermarket if you're looking for him because there just 
aren't the same numbers that you will find with some of the other driver figures. He has actually a very deceptively plain outfit. It has a lot of great detail, but it's rather odd that they chose such a plain tan for a Cobra figure. You'd think that he would have a more uh, eye-popping color scheme, and yet he looks more like a G.I. Joe here. Interestingly enough, in 1990, they used the same body for Skydive, one of the Sky Patrol figures, who is remolded in blue plastic with white details. So he winds up looking a bit more like a Cobra than the Gyro Viper does. The Gyro Viper's single accessory is the removable helmet, which again is very plain but sort of practical in its own way. It has a very large face shield and you can see the detail of the strap just sort of holding it onto what is, well quite frankly, a, a, very, <laughs> a very practical, very uh, normal shaped helmet. Just has a tiny little bit of greeblies on here perhaps suggesting that he has uh, some type of tint control or maybe some night vision on there. I don't know. But the helmet is made of a very hard plastic, which is very unfortunate because it winds up rubbing up against the nose of the Gyro Viper. Now you can see my nose is actually, I think I've repainted it twice already now, and it still kind of chips off. Unfortunately, the head is made of the purple plastic, so the face is just painted on there. And of course, when you rub that off, he winds up with a Tin Man nose. Interesting enough, this is almost the same thing as the 1988 Toxo Viper. He had a purple hood over a painted face whose uh, helmet sort of rubbed up against his nose. Uh, his was a bit of a strange kind of detail around his hood, however. Whereas this guy, he just has like tiny little rivets and things. It looks a bit more normal, and I can see why in the comic books, they actually just kind of left him plain like this, without the helmet obscuring the face. However, you can see a ton of detail, like what looks like a ring here. Normally that would be a ring for, uh, I guess, a parachute or like a life preserver, which is what I think that this purple thing is. I think that purple thing is like a life preserver. If he has to ditch his helicopter into the ocean, he just pulls this and just uh, waits for rescue. Assuming that Cobra actually rescues their troopers, I'm not really sure about that. But you can also see some hose detail, which is very strange. It's almost like he's wearing a pressure suit. I'm not really sure why you would need that in a helicopter, unless of course he was in the rocket pod and you would need that for the G-forces. Again, it's uh, not really well explained about that on the file card. And of course, one of the more interesting things is, of course he has a little map on his uh, thigh there, just like quite a few no other characters do, like Wild Weasel and Ghost Rider. They also had little maps on their uh, legs. Somehow I forgot about these two very prominent Cobra helicopter pilots, the 1991 Interrogator and the 1992 Heli Viper. Especially over the Heli Viper because his purple and red color scheme actually goes very well with the Mamba. So all I can do is compare him to the 1984 Wild Weasel, who again has a very practical looking outfit, despite the fact that it's bright red. And again, I think that's one of the things that um, sort of makes people think this guy's really plain and sort of strange looking uh, as far as being a Cobra goes because despite the fact that his outfit is just as uh, practical as Wild Weasel's, it's just a very odd, very, I don't know, it's almost a too practical, too G.I. Joe-like color scheme for it to be Cobra. And again, he also has the uh, map on his thigh just like he does. And again, to compare him to maybe a G.I. Joe opposite number, the only one I can really think of is, of course, Wild Bill, or perhaps 1980 Windmill, but I don't exactly have that figure just yet. But you can see they both have very practical outfits. Once again, they're not really as fanciful as the jet pilots that uh, come on either side. If you're looking for a Mamba on the aftermarket, they actually don't go for quite a lot, which is very interesting considering how many missiles and bombs that you have to make sure that is all there for this thing to be complete. Of course, it is a fairly sturdy vehicle. And despite the fact that some people have complained that, yeah, the uh, double rotor mechanism sometimes breaks down, it, it can be fixed fairly easily, like I said, with just a bit of uh, care to make sure that the rotor blades are really wedged in there on the mushroom pegs. 
Another thing which uh, unfortunately I neglected to mention is the fact that the machine guns on the attack pods are, well, fairly easy just to pop off there. So this is something that you do have to remember to uh, make sure that they are still there on both of the attack pods. The figure itself, again, is fairly easy to find on the aftermarket. It's just not really that popular. Rather unfortunate, but that's just the way the market is, I suppose. Appear. Here I've just put the rocket on the other side of the tail. I mean, take a look at the mama just by itself. Rather unfortunate that you couldn't get these either on the after the. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.